and shout out to the edible. They got me feeling that it's quite questionable. The question who the fly is in a session of professional. Professionally stepping up the pedestal. Lost the small shit, it's a testament. Testing is a testament to my particular fortitude. And I'm obsessed and possessed by the aura too. More or less so, so let's go. Four times four, bars down the boardwalk. And I won't pass go. Alright, keep your mind spinning like tops. As I spin on the spinning rock. Spinning through the universe, we getting dropped. They kind of hoping that I win and stop. But we keep it going, we just spin the block. Yep, a country boy like good gravy. Boys is good and lazy. Coming up slim like young shady. But if you're thinking I'm crazy, since I buck two, baby. My motto been fuck you, pay me. Uh, D, D, don't scratch the surface. The most important day is the day you figure your purpose. You in tune with the universe, so you work it. Cause shit hit different when it's perfectly perfect. Blood hit different when it's perfectly perfect. Uh, Keep the grass, cause stay away from them serpents. You in tune with the universe, so you work it. Cause shit hit different when it's perfectly perfect. If I consume a mushroom and take flight, every time, man, a blind man can never lose insight. Equally yoked like a ride you can't fight. Whenever my pen right, create a different energy to bend light, huh? Like black holes, random. Feel like every soul will turn to the nearest one on earth, but that's a different topic. But right now I'm feeling, feeling thropy. I'm about to cash out of some juice, I feel the will to drop it. I write on watch presentations, I read publications. See, confrontations, a bad representation of what we chasing. So chill, just be patient and get in line. We all about to make it, but give me mine. Taco Tuesday, margaritas, I hit a line. Little cutie, we got a speech, she really mine. Couple shroomies, we hit the roomie, it's overtime. Yeah, it's overtime. Yeah, you. Uh, D, D, don't scratch the surface. The most important day is the day you figure your purpose. You in tune with the universe, so you work it. Cause shit hit different when it's perfectly perfect. Blood hit different when it's perfectly perfect. Keep the grass, cause stay away from them serpents. You in tune with the universe, so you work it. Cause shit hit different when it's perfectly perfect. of a magi, the information supplied by some guys get debunked on live, CK and Juju, I chill in the cut, but if you boys want to fade, then I'm chefing you up, I organize lies, the beats are disorganized, truth every time, kudos, kudos niggas, decorated pseudo killers, space age app again, back again, an organized lie, the beats are disorganized, truth every time, kudos, Kudos, niggas, decorated pseudo killers, space age half against, tapping in. I've always been fly, that's an actual omen. You can catch me in the sky, ask Anthony Bowman. You see me with his telescope, I was actually floating. I'm some good cush, the Savio is actually grown. See, Gullah Gullah and Kent is where the money gets spent. The boys got some books that cost as much as you rent. The second verse should be smash Rockwell, but I rock well. Underground like some Marion Rockwell. In the ring like I'm the rock whale. Hell, create a different wave that can rock whales. Hell, shit swell like lunatides. My entendres, I've got you to who describe. Euthanize foolish guys. Scholastically, haphazardly, turn your camera on and look me in my eyes. And please do subscribe. Ain't the 80 blind cripple or crazy You win for a new surprise It's DQ A organized lie The beats are disorganized Truth every time 
kudos, who those niggas? Ooh. Decorated pseudo killers. Yeah. Space age that begins, back again. An organized lie, lie. the piece of this organized truth every time. Kudos, who those niggas? Ooh. Decorated pseudo killers. Yeah. Space age that begins, tapping in. Well organized lie, defeats a disorganized truth every time. Woo hoo we, man! Y'all already know what it is, man. It's the pseudo killers on deck, and we're coming to do what we got to do, and we're going to do what we got to do. We standing tall, we standing strong. Hey, pseudo killers on deck. Hey, what's good, Clark Kent? What it do? What it do? What it do? You on mute, you on mute, you on mute. <laughs> That's the style now, yo. You got to start off with the mute, and then you just yeah, come on. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, what's up, man? Yeah. Hey, just enjoying my Sunday, man. Finally off a day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Got to get it in. Loving this hot weather when I'm not working. Um, man, ready to hear this. This uh, Dr. Moya, I think the crowd is in for a treat today, man. What's up to all the pseudo killers on the panel? Everybody in the chat. What's that? Yeah, for a treat, man. Hey, Serious B, what's good with you, man? What it do? What it do? What it do? All right, peace to the killers. Again, my orders are with the army, right? Right, peace to the pseudo killers. We at war. Again, you know, this particular, you know, video and what we're going to review today, this is something that's near and dear to my heart, especially, you know, and one of the reasons why is because some people in our community came together, our Discord community. Shout out to the pseudo killer Discord community that actually came together, spent time and resources, actually dedicated resources to actually make this happen, right? Um, and there was a lot of, a ton, a ton of internal coordination as well. And the sisters did an amazing job for putting that together. So we wanted to bring that to the community. So shout out to them and let's get it in. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, man, I appreciate the army, man, that came through, man, with that. Hey, Sister Juju, what it do? What it do? What it do? Peace, family. Peace to the panel. Peace to the chat. I just can't wait for you to get it in with Dr. Moya McTeer. It's a pretty awesome interview. I'm just happy that we can, uh, you know, uh, do our due diligence, bring scientific literacy to the community and also bring these experts to the community. So there is never any question anymore. Mm, mm. Yeah, never no question right there. Hey, Miss Tiff, what's good with you? What it do? What it do? What it do? What's up? <laughs> How is everyone this evening? Mm, yeah, we good, man. Ready to tap into that, um, that, that powerful lecture that we did, man. All right. We ready. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, let me see. I got the link right here. No, I don't got the link. Where you send the link at? Um, Brendan. Yeah, Brendan, where you at? I thought he sent the link to the. Uh, hold on. Let me right. see. So I do. I did send it to your abs you wear. So you should have it there. But if you, if you can't pull it down, I have it teed up. I can share it and play it as well. So we could do it either way. Um. Okay. Yeah, you send it, but you didn't give me. I, I tried to access it through the the other oh, email, really? and I okay. sent you the thing to get permission. And I could have sworn you sent it to the Abju because I got it in my mm -hmm. phone, but I don't know why. Oh, loading images is failed. I'm trying to figure out why I can't. Um. Yeah, that's terrible right there. Mm -hmm. Um. Again, if you don't have it, I could always tee it up. I have the video up here as well. So just let yeah, me know you how you want to do it. All right. So let's let some people come into the room. You would have to give me permission. Actually, okay. I'll send it back to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I got I, I actually got the No, I got it. I got it. Okay. I just I just went through my other um, Yep. It's about a gig. 
or a little over a gig. So you may have to download it. Not sure mm -hmm. if it's going to take it. some time. So let me know. I actually got it. Yep. No, I got it. Okay. I got it. I got it there. So we're good, man. I just want to let some people get into the room, man. So how's everything been going, man? I know we um kind of like um been uh just making sure that we got um our, our feet on the ground, man, after this powerful interview, man. I actually, um, you know, just appreciate the work. And, you know, we just was talking about some things, making some donations uh, to some some spots, maybe in Africa somewhere, underprivileged people. And, you know, that's just the work, man. The work is real powerful, man. We got the experts coming through here, man. I think the platform is growing like it's supposed to with the proper information and, and enough style and pizzazz. You know what I'm saying to keep the people, man. I think it's a healthy mix, and you know I'm I'm appreciating our place in the community, uh, being a dead set against pseudos. And I think we made we talked about um, people misrepresenting uh, doctors and misrepresenting scientists and just acting like things that they are not. And I know for for our platform, man, we're not gonna let you on here. Uh, if you're trying to, to to claim to have a credential that you don't, no matter what you want to be called, right? You gotta. We we take credentials important over here, and I think that the, the greater community should too. And that's just not the little niche called the conscious community, but just in the greater African American community, and in America. Period. Uh, the standard and the litmus test is based off of if you have credentials then you can speak about it if you choose. If you don't, don't act like you do. Anybody want to speak on that? I, I would I would just say this in terms of, you know, you know, academic credentials. Uh, those those things are hard for people to go through, right? Uh, it, it's not fair for people that actually go through the rigors of the academic study, right, and get the accolade of a PhD or a medical doctor, and then someone just come in off the streets willy-nilly and just claim that accolade for themselves just because they would like to hear themselves called that, right? That's absolutely not fair. Um, but the broader or the more important piece is, is, is the credibility that goes behind it, right? Because there's something tied to when you, when you, you know, if you're, if you're an academic or you, with all of this stuff, right? Say, hey, a lot of us signs these codes of academic integrity, which ties us to saying, hey, we have to be unbiased in our research, unbiased in our approaches as well. Right. So that's a part of that. Right. A lot. Of, so you can sidestep all of that. Right. When you're not actually credentialed or if you're not certified or, you know, through some type of official channels in that regard. Right. So those are important pieces because it, it lends to the credibility and the accountability pieces as well. Right. That's why a lot, a lot of times those accolades are really important. Right. Is the certification piece, right? That do we that we know that you've actually gone through the rigors of these studies, you know what you're talking about, and if you're wrong, you can be held accountable. That's deep. That's right. it. Yeah, it's hard. You can't hold you two personalities accountable. <laughs> <laughs> There's no hey man, I'm sorry, we can, we're gonna take your YouTube license away from you because you said that fluoride is harmful. There's no right. There's no backing behind you, except the community and the greater community actually uh, aren't really prepared for the conversations that we actually have. And, and I think you make a great point. You want to add something to that, Ken? Because that's a that's yeah. But, but just right before Ken jumps in, I, yeah. I'll give you just a, a small brief example. Like like for instance, um, they say I have a master's degree from Penn State University. In a, in the course of that, I had to sign an academic integrity um, agreement. Right. Or it was encouraged for me to do so. Right. Within that, that's why I don't willy nilly toss around the idea of saying that someone is a plagiarist. Mm. Right. Because accusing someone of plagiarism, right, under a, a oath of academic integrity, if you're wrong, you could be held accountable for that. So, again, those are some of the, the things that we think about. But, yeah, but go ahead, brother. Yeah. So I was going to say, um, you know, that's there's usually a red flag, man. When you hear somebody getting called a doctor and they're not a doctor. And I know that, you know, this community likes to play around with it because, you know, we we like to have fun. You know what I'm saying? So we might be like, you know, you might be into, like, say, for instance, uh, you into uh, the evolution. Right. So somebody might call you a scientist or a doctor, but they just they know your passion. So they they give you that that love. You know what I'm saying? But 
And on, enough, the other of that, on the other side of that, it's people that's taking advantage of being called that and are actually scamming people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you just have to, you know, it's a red I'm flag when you're getting man. called something you're not and you're accepting it. And then you're going by that title when you're doing your videos and when you're doing your uh, writing your books or whatever like that. And so that's when it becomes a problem. So I, I agree with Brendan, man. It takes a lot of hard work to become that, you know, uh, these titles and stuff like that. So, yeah, man, so, should nobody be playing with that, though. Juju, you want to add something? Are you good? How about you, Mr. Tiff? Any y'all want to say anything to that? They nailed it. I'm good. You're good. You good, Mr. Tiff? Yep. Mm. So for me, that's why I reject people calling me anything besides what I really am. Um, at this point, I've become a science influencer. I influence people to look at science. I'm a science advocate. I advocate science for the black community. I advocate science for the greater American community, and I advocate science for planet Earth. It's the measure of understanding your natural world, and Homo sapiens sapiens live in a natural world. So the tool that was developed by human beings to understand the natural phenomenon which resides in the natural world is just that. It's science. With all its ups and downs and rights and wrongs, in the spotted history through humanity, uh, we, we found that it it be the measure of understanding, one, our place in the cosmos, and two, our place uh, on Earth. So I reject being called something that I have not earned. And that's just for me, And I, because I think it's a mindset. Once you start accepting that, then you start to thinking you that, right? It's, you know, it, for, for me, we actually have real doctors on the team, like Dr. Oyama Yats. She's a real doctor. So, you know, like, that's disrespectful to her. She, she'll pull me up. So what's up with that? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, because she had, you know, she was tried and tested in, in front of her peers. That's the level. That's the measure. Uh, shout out uh, to Conscious Intenuity. Uh, Dr. Mian is engaged right now in um, scientific literacy program. They're in camp right now. Baltimore, Maryland, raising the literacy level of the babies. And you know, we always talk about literacy and juvenile detention centers and, 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 and being caught up in that program. 80% uh, of the people in that program are illiterate. And so, you know, it speaks to whether you get in trouble or not, your level of literacy. So we know what scientific literacy uh, talks about. Uh, it helps you in your community, right? The way you see your community. It helps you in understanding scientific uh, information. And you know, we just went through the pandemic, okay? And when we was on the other side of a Kent, we, we all was afraid, but it was our literacy that blocked off the complete foolery that occurred in our community and in the greater American community. It was a lot of, it was a lot of foolery that, that actually took place. And it was based off of the, the, the level of ignorance on said subject. Right. And so, you know, our little small niche we had, we was able together to educate the people and at least give them something to look at to make informed decisions. And I would and I would even push to say that, you know, that that debate that took place in Harlem, the great Harlem debate about vaccines, I, I would I, I would venture to say that it spurred the experts to dive in because y'all remember early in the game, the experts were like, you know how you say it, Kent, why we, we don't want to. You know, we listen to the podcast like mm -hmm. they it's it's almost like you giving something some weight to it when you talk about it, right. because we know that the actual debate does not occur. OK, on YouTube, TikTok. The actual debate actually occurs in science and that debate has already been had. And those questions has already been answered for the last hundred years. That does not mean that more things not going to come to the table. But what it means is that there's actually no debate whether vaccines are safe and effective. So right. we, we can safely check off that coronavirus, okay, is a vaccine preventable disease at high levels. And we don't have to debate that. So, you know, I just appreciate the work, man. Um, what well, we got 57,000 people in the building. Give them a couple more minutes, man. And we're going to bring this expert in and watch the level of conversation that occurred, man. And so I like to also think 
the army the pseudo killer army in the discord man that actually helped bring the sister in those donations were valuable and i also appreciate the people that supported um the actual interview right we appreciate that man and and to make sure y'all send this link out to y'all friends right when we start to you know play the video man the conversation was held at a high level our community need more conversations than this i mean like this what y'all say i was yeah. absolutely and plus you know if we, if we can if you know i know our, our mods they're on the panel actively participating if if we can uh let's let's put some discord invites in the the chat as well right uh if you guys haven't joined the discord right feel free tonight we're gonna uh, have some open invites to that right it's it's a great platform if you guys don't have the discord application initially it can be a little bit daunting it's a little bit of a learning curve but as soon as you get used to it it's a great platform to interact Right, we're always on there throughout the day. You got some downtime, you're interested, stroll through. We're always sharing great resources there. Again, right, join the Discord community if you can. Yeah, it's live 24-7 in there. Oh, <laughs> that's ab pseudo absolutely. Pseudo killer, pseudo killer 24 7. Like yeah, one yeah, o'clock right. in the morning, we in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Y'all yeah, be wow. Yes, indeed. Y'all right. be y'all be live and direct. <laughs> and plus, I'll just add on to this, right? Uh, um, there's some a lot of interesting sort of academic works that have been released over the last maybe month or so, right? Remember the conference proceedings that uh, reviewed the Afro-Asiatic language phylum was out, right? So we all were sort of going through that internally as well. That's some very, very interesting information there. I don't think it's nothing surprising from what I've read, right? I think it's a, a lot of it is sort of, reiterating some of the outstanding work that needs to be done in terms of, you know, gathering more information about the proto languages of, you know, the proto languages inside the phylum itself, right? It sort of outlines the difficulties there. Uh, I think that piece was very interesting as well as Christopher Eric's work, right? That's dealing about uh, dealing with the, uh, the Africanity of ancient Egypt in this chapter five of his book. Right. So, you know, those are some very interesting books. I think inside of the pseudo killers, we've sort of been going through everybody's sort of sharing that and reading those books actively there. So maybe, you know, some subsequent shows, we can go through those, some of those works in detail as well. Mm. Yeah, let's do that. Well, you've been hiding that juju. Yeah, she act like she's on the panel. I see you, Juju. You act, that was a test. It was a test statement to see if you really was here. Now she I'm faked to get the avatar. <laughs> Fake this out. Whatever. I'm here. Nah, Literally. that don't count. Now nah, you off somewhere on another show, getting in trouble. I know. I'm, I've, I actually have not been and am not. <laughs> still, still looking for hey, the. Hey, speaking <laughs> of another show, is it isn't Brother Cedric over doing his way in on Sonata right now? No, they ain't started yet. So that just came so, out of nowhere. Expect people to stop whatever they was doing out of the middle right? of nowhere and just do that. <laughs> so I, no, I, I heard the brothers are supposed to be doing what was it? Uh brother Cedric and uh Lex Vortex supposed to be doing their way in for the debate tonight on Sign of the Studio. It ain't no right? debate. Oh, yeah. For well, the, it was yeah. like a way in, just a discussion to yeah, sort of you know, in two seconds. How we clean schedule. Go ahead, look, look. No, no, I mean, it's still gonna, is it still going to be? It was. It was agreement. They agreed to be on tonight. So, not yeah, sure if they're um, gonna do it or not. You said yeah, he got to go somewhere real quick. He hit with them going somewhere real quick. Who? Cedric. I'm got to do something real quick. I'll be back. Here, but... Yeah, you can't hey, put look. a person in the spot like that. Hey, but like, look, if the people, the people go, he's gonna get, he's gonna get accused for this. Yeah, well, <laughs> he just gonna have to. Like the trucks. Um, um, look, if don't, people... don't, hey, don't commit if you're not ready. I'm telling you, you gotta I don't think he's commit. I don't think he's you know, if, if the people go and look at the show we did about what two, three days ago, he already done beat him up. Like I'm surprised it's still a debate. He done killed him. He done beat him up every time he's come over here, actually. Every yeah, time the like, counter Cedric get him at work. So, I'm surprised he's still breathing, yo. Honestly. Exactly. I mean, we've already proved his stance to be fallacious. Um, I wanted to speak on. What you, That's what every you topic saying. we got, though, we undefeated. I mean, right. We, right. I want to speak on what you paid for it about bringing some of these 
experts to the community. Well, uh, one of my things is it's time for us to take a hold of some of this toxic behavior we all possess. Yes, some things are fun and games, but when it comes to the welfare of our future, uh, particularly our children, and the uh, hazardous effects some of this pseudology may have, um, we definitely need to be on board with supporting, uh, particularly some of the experts that in various fields that we have brought and will be continue to bring more in the future. It's our due diligence to support. Um, it's also our due diligence to support others who are doing the same as far as embarking on our children to make sure that they're prepared for the future, including Dr. Maya and the things she has going on, um, including Hugh Butter, if he wants to do that for our children and the things he has going on concerning our children. And we need to do more in giving these platforms, um, especially Dr. Maya and Conscious Ingenuity, the, the uh, support and, and um, our time as needed uh, she actually does a awesome job of having students in uh, a multi-generational panel on her show at times, which is a beautiful thing and it is much necessary. Um, it's sort of her idea of, of bringing this, um, what shall I say, uh, how shall I say, um, bringing this idea of a communal family to the web in a sense so younger generations and older generations can discuss certain topics at hand um so we have this ability to understand each other which is fascinating and awesome and i think we're missing that so i just urge you all to you know be supportive uh, in these in these things, like we can laugh and we can have fun and we can play games, but there's a time and place for everything. And we are out of time. It ain't running. We're out of time when getting in place when it comes to being scientific literate and also uh, getting our future in place to um, be, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a able to uh, to stand on their own and, and, um, and be on that front field of scientific literacy or scientific advancement, so to speak. We need that. You sound like Noah's up. We run out of time. <laughs> we ain't run out of no dang. We run out of time. The arc is open. This, the, the, the sense the of arc. urgency. <laughs> I, I, I understand you, Juju. You got, you know, a lot of fire on the unk's ass. It's a sense of urgency. Right? I'm not playing with Bobby tonight. <laughs> running out of time. I don't have the energy. <laughs> You better get I'm that just, chose. I'm gonna punch him. I'm gonna go ahead. Go ahead. I'm a good right. fucking guy. The end of the world. This is the Dr. Moya right now. Because exactly. if you don't get it now, it's not exactly. gonna be right tomorrow. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know that, that's it. You know what no it's art. What happened to all the insects on the art? Why we got so many damn? <laughs> oh, now? here you go. I mean, if it happened, then damn. They had them in a jar. <laughs> they don't talk about having any insects. Is it? They have them in a jar. It's a clay pot. It was the jars was invented. It was it was it was them pottery jars from uh, the Nakata. <laughs> oh, not the play. I mean, right? Is pots it? and pans. Them having them pots and pans. Oh, Nakata, I begin to confuse. I need to get myself together. That's what somebody told me in the Discord. I need to get myself together. I'm working on it though. You can't say that all the insects was in a jar. <laughs> you can't say they was in a jar. Now they was in them pottery. That wavy line pottery. That's what they was in. Excuse me. Are you saying they scamming? They scamming, man. <laughs> Oh, man. All right, so look, we got 70,000 in the building, man. They say they scamming when it comes to noise. Oh, they couldn't fit all the insects in the jar. Man. Yeah, I was tripping. Uh, I saw one jump uh, where, you know, they got the picture of all the two animals going on board. Uh -huh. And they got two of the lions going on board. <laughs> so, you know, right. They don't have a female and a male. It's like two... <laughs> Two males is going on the boat, yo. Exactly. <laughs> um, so my urgency also oh, has to play. Man, my urgent. I want to add this on this tidbit. My urgency when I was speaking on that and my sense of urgency also has to play in. You know, when we're talking about 
you know, uh, securing generational wealth or whatnot. Well, also these jobs that can help us secure that are in the fields of tech and whatnot and in any scientific field. So um, the urgency for that is also great. And this is where we need to be leading our future and our children mm-hmm. and our young adults and our our young people, period. And even some of, you know, our old people <laughs> that still got it. And this is where we need to be leading them into. Um, I think once we... Um, I... So okay, Damn, I'm uh, Juju, I'm go ahead and uh, introduce um, our guest speaker for tonight. Oh man, yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have for you an extraordinary young lady who has um, done amazing work. Not only does she have one Ivy League degree, she has several, including one from uh, Columbia University. Uh, P- in astrophysics, a PhD in astrophysics. She um, dauntingly uh, goes by a science communicator, which she does very well. Um, She also majored in folklore, which gives a very interesting and unique look at how we view science. So without further ado, the beautiful Dr. Moya McTeer. All right, let me do this right. Let me mute myself out, man. Let's get into it, man. Um, hey, y'all know what it is, man. Pseudo killers at the movies. Dr. Moya. All right, there we go. Whenever you're ready, Bobby. All right. A well-organized lie defeats a disorganized truth every time. Woo-hoo, we, man. Y'all already know what it is, man. It's the pseudo killers on deck. And we're coming to do what we got to do. And we're going to do what we got to do. We standing tall. We standing strong. Pseudo killers on deck. Hey, what's good, Sirius B? What it do? What it do? All right, peace, peace, brother. Long peace to the panel and peace, peace to our esteemed guest, Dr. McTeer. All right, I think this is going to be a treat for the entire community. So, yeah, I won't take a lot of time. Let's get into it. All right, peace. Hey, what it do, Juju? What it do? What it do? What it do, fam? Thank you for joining us tonight. We're so excited. Um, and thank you again, Dr. McTee, for indulging us and in being here today. <laughs> A-C-K, I see you. What it do? What it do? What it do? Peace, peace. Peace to the panel and peace to the chat. Thank you for coming through, Dr. McTeer. Looking forward to getting your wisdom and insight tonight. Clark Kent, you know what it is, man. What it do? What it do? What it do? You on mute. That's what it do. (laughs) (laughs) What's up, man? Glad to be here. Y'all can hear me? Loud and clear. All right. You know what I'm saying? Glad to be here, man. Glad to have you with us, uh, Dr. Moyer. Man, I, I think it's going to be a great interview, man. And just ready to learn some things and, and have a good conversation, man. Miss Tiffany, what it do? What it do? What's up with you? I'm doing good. And thank you all for being here. And, and welcome again, Dr. Mateer. Juju, it's on you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Brother Unk, Bobby. (laughs) Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, We want to thank you all for your support in our endeavors to promote scientific literacy. We are excited to have you all join us this evening for a very interesting and exciting discussion about our universe and maybe a little folklore for Lucky. (laughs) Our guest is an extraordinary young woman who is uh, creating a very unique path as a science communicator in the field of astrophysics. Not only does she hold four Ivy League PhDs, I mean, excuse me, degrees, but she is the first in Harvard's history to graduate with a double major in astrophysics and folklore and mythology. She is also the first black woman to receive her PhD from the prestigious astronomy program at Columbia University. Not to mention, she is the creator of an exquisite piece of work, the autobiography of our galaxy, The Milky Way. Uh, this phenomenal young woman has already 
so much and I could go on forever. But we, the pseudo killers, want to give you all the opportunity to enjoy and experience our guests in this space as much as possible. So without further ado, my fellow earthlings, I present to you the innovative, the incomparable, the beautiful Dr. Moya McTeer. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time to indulge us this evening, Dr. McTee. I heard someone call you that and I thought that was awesome. So I hope you don't mind. <laughs> No, not at all. Um, one of my one of the many hats that I wear is as a host for a show called Fate and Fabled about mythology and folklore. And within the little Fate and Fabled crew, they call mm -hmm. me Dr. McTee and the other host is Dr. Z. So it, it's nice. I love that. Um, so I wanted you to briefly tell us how you got to where you are today. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to... It's I want to preface this story and say that at at no point along the story did I think I would get to this point where I am in life until maybe a couple of years ago uh, when I got the deal to write the Milky Way's autobiography. That's when I knew that this was a good path for me. Um, but I'll say it started as a kid. I grew up in the woods um, as an only child, kind of. I now have brothers, uh, but I didn't. And so I spent most of my time reading fantasy books and playing around in the woods and just being really good at school. And I was interested in everything. I had no idea what I wanted to major in. And so when I got to college, it was just kind of up to chance. I lived across the street from the folklore and mythology building, and they always gave out like tea and cakes. Um, I'm very motivated by my stomach. You'll see that in this story. And uh, I was dragged to an astronomy class by one of my rugby teammates. I played rugby in college. And the teacher said we'd get free pizza every week. And I was like, oh, oh, hell yeah. You know, I'm a broke college student. I will take some free carbs. And uh, I think everyone, a lot of people can relate. Um, but by the end of my sophomore year of studying both of these things, I was hooked on both. I wasn't quite sure how I was going to combine them, but I ended up writing a science fiction novel that was set on a real planet outside of our solar system that I had studied as part of my research in college. And that, without knowing it, was my first attempt at facts-based fictional world building. And then I went to a, a PhD program at Columbia for astronomy because it seemed more strategic uh, than pursuing my love, my passion for folklore. Uh, so I got the PhD. I learned a lot about the universe and galaxies and the way that stars move and change over time and the ways that planets are different from each other in different parts of the galaxy. That's what I really loved to think about. And then I decided I could combine them. Um, when it came time to thinking about getting my my big girl job, you know, I I wanted to do what was fun. And so I started making my own podcasts. I started doing a lot of talks about science. And uh, over time, it snowballed into a career that I could actually sustain. And so now I'm a science communicator, which, uh, which is a very broad term that uh, my, like, my Nana does not understand what I do. She keeps asking me when I'm going to get a job. And I'm like, Nana, I have my own business. I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Oh my goodness, that's so cute. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so right into our first question, um, you spoke briefly about when science or your perception of science became racialized for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you expound on that shift of perception? And also, could you please discuss the importance of inclusion, access, and representation in the fields of sciences, uh, particularly hard sciences? 100%. Yeah. So I, I grew up in the country, like in a very rural area. I was the only black person. There were Confederate flags everywhere. Um, and so I grew up experiencing racism in this extremely overt, in-your-face way. Um, mm -hmm. And when I got to college at Harvard, I was like, oh my God, the world, this is perfect. You know, there were actually other black people around. Um, people weren't like yelling slurs when I walked down the street. Like I just thought it was a much better place. And the the summer after my mm, the summer after my junior year of college, I was mm, 
No, it was the summer after my sophomore year. I was lucky enough to be in a research program that was research plus social justice. And they really talked about systemic racism, uh, specifically within academia, but we also had to talk about it in the larger context of society. And so that was an, uh, an eye opener. And I had a few uh, racially charged experiences at Harvard. And so I started to see how racism could be systemic and it could be covert. And that was that was an eye opener. And I realized I could not just be uh, an astrophysicist, you know, I have to be a woman, I'm a, I'm a black person, I'm a queer person, and I have to be loud and proud about all of these different identities that I have to find all of the communities that I can, because this space was not built for people like me, like us. This Understood. space was built to keep people like us out. Um, and so representation is important because it lets us find community. It lets us build uh, support networks that keep people alive and keep people thriving within academia. I would not be the astrophysicist I am without the people I met in that uh, research plus social justice program. You know, they're, they're my best friends today. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. That's me. So next up, we have Brendan. Brendan has a question for you. All right. All right. So I'll get right into it. So in terms of, you know, this question would be for, you know, people in our audience that may not necessarily be, you know, science or physics enthusiasts, mm -hmm. right? And, but if you could, could you actually go into, you know, what is the field of astrophysics, right? In, in an overall sense, right? What is its significance within the scientific fields, right? So just at a, at a broad level there, right? So how does it actually help us to improve our understanding of the universe, right? And uh, how does it actually help us understand the physical world? I love that question. Um, I got a lot of flack from my pre-med and my like psychology major friends in college for studying astronomy because it's not a practical science. And I think that's beautiful. We study astrophysics for the sake of gaining new knowledge. And that's just like a beautiful human endeavor. Um, but it's also something that lets us answer some of the most fundamental questions that humans can ask. Where did we come from? Are we alone? Why are we here? What else is there? You know, um, and so I think that there is a lot of benefit to studying astronomy, which is the study of space, of outer space and the universe. So it encompasses galaxies, black holes, stars, planets. Um, there are people who know a lot about space and study space, but think of Earth in the context of space. They think of Earth as a planet. They think about its formation. Um, and so astronomy or astrophysics comes out of this long history of indigenous people of of our ancestors around the world looking up at the night sky for very practical reasons there used to be a, a much fuzzier boundary between astronomy and astrology uh, people would look up at the night sky to keep time and to navigate and to um pass down knowledge from generation to generation and that attention that people paid to the night sky eventually became associated with math and we added numbers and physics onto it. And we started to understand gravity and some of the real fundamental forces that underpin the motion that we've been observing for thousands of years. And so another thing that, that astrophysics gives us, one thing that I do a lot in my work, is mm -hmm. this connection between science and folk knowledge and indigenous mm -hmm. knowledge that people around the world have. Oh, that's, that's a great explanation. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, All right. Thanks. All right, our next question comes from CK. Hello, how you doing, Dr. Matera? Um, my question is a, a little bit more personable. Um, I saw on your YouTube channel that you do a lot of videos on uh, fictional world building. And, you know, growing up, I read a lot of comic books and even wrote my own stories and made my own world up. So I was definitely heavily interested in uh, the courses that you were starting on fictional world building. So I wanted to ask, what was your motivation to starting this teaching course on fictional world building? 
Mm, yeah, thank you for that question because um, you know I have this degree in in astrophysics and I I studied folklore, but my my love my passion is fictional world building because it sits at the intersection of those two things. Um, after I graduated from college and I started to get more into the astronomy side, I was craving a way to find my folklore roots again. And so I started teaching workshops on how to let science inspire your creativity. Those eventually morphed into a live show that I did uh, called ExoLore, teaching people uh, how to build a fictional world based on expert guest knowledge. And uh, then it turned into a podcast and I, over time, I realized that the way I approach fictional worlds is kind of different from how a lot of other people approach it because I have this science background um, and I don't believe in gatekeeping. Uh, I believe in sharing my knowledge with anyone who is around to hear it, to, to take it in. And uh, so I wanted to share my process with other people. Uh, so real quick, I, I teach people how to build worlds in five steps. You start with your intention for the world. What do you want to do with it? What kind of world do you want it to be? Uh, what is the biggest difference between our reality and this fictional world you're building? And then just in nature, you start with the environment and then move on to biology that would evolve in that uh, environment under those conditions. And then the culture that would arise from those life forms, biological needs, and what resources they had available. Those are the steps. And I want to, I want everyone to, to have it if they want it. All right, wonderful. We have Kent. Kent's next. Yep. Yeah, hello. Uh, so I was having a conversation with someone about how big, you know, the, the galaxy was and, you know, how we mm. are fans of it and, you know, um, how long it was across and the spiral of it. And, it was like, well, how how do the scientists know that if the, the satellites that we have haven't gone outside of the galaxy that be able to take a picture of it, right? So I was wondering if you could explain uh, the methods used to develop a visual model of the Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, people only first realized we were actually in a galaxy that was one galaxy among many in the universe about a hundred years ago. There was this great debate in the 1920s uh, about whether or not galaxies were a thing. And so this is fairly new knowledge. Um, but for a long time, we recognized that we were around one star that was probably one of many in this collection of stars. And so one of the earliest attempts to map the galaxy was done by William and Caroline Herschel in the, I want to say 1700s. And they made some wackadoodle assumptions. They assumed that all stars were the same color. They assumed that uh, we were kind of in the center of things. And so they uh, made that faulty assumption. And that resulted in this, this first map that looked really weird. Not first map of the actual galaxy because indigenous people had been mapping what they could see, but first attempt at mapping like the bird's eye view of this collection of stars. And so now we do not use those same assumptions. We know that stars are different sizes and different colors. We know that we are not in the center. Uh, and that's because we have really powerful telescopes that can see really far away. And essentially they let us count how many stars are along our path in different directions. And from uh, creating that three-dimensional map one slice at a time, we've been able to figure out how our galaxy is shaped. It also helps that we have looked at a lot of other galaxies and we've seen that they usually fall into one of a few different categories. They're either a spiral galaxy or they're a big blob. And uh, we can we could tell from that uh, like slicing that we weren't a big blob, and so it makes sense that we would be a spiral galaxy like so many others that we have seen. Yeah, appreciate that. Appreciate the question. All right. <laughs> and next up, <clears throat> excuse me, we have Bobby. Doctor Moya, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, you know it. Yeah. So there's always a running discussion in semi-debate and this question is kind of like two people mm -hmm. talk about indigenous african tribes there's two of them in particular the nile valley egyptians and the dogon one 
in your opinion or in your expert um, understanding, did the Egyptians understand the Big Bang? And two, mm. did the Dogon know or see Sirius B? Great questions. Uh, I'll start with the Egyptians. They most certainly did not understand the Big Bang in the way that we do. Physicists and astrophysicists now understand the Big Bang in terms of uh, chemistry and the chemical reactions that would have happened in milliseconds after the Big Bang. We've done this with simulations. We've done this with experiments at the Large Hadron Collider to figure out how energetic different events would have been. We know about the the fundamental forces of gravity and the the nuclear forces that bind atoms together. We know about different scales of the world now that the Egyptians did not know about. They might have had a conceptual understanding of a, a cyclical universe or a universe that was dynamic and changed over time, um, but there were many cultures around the world that had creation myths that are kind of similar to how the world was actually created, you know? Um, there are a lot of myths that start with nothing. They start with chaos or oblivion, and then uh, the earth forms, and then the air forms, uh, and then there's light, you know? And so these these orders are similar to the actual order in which things happened physically, um, but that's a different type of understanding of, of the Big Bang than we have. Um, about the Dogon, they probably did see um, Sirius A. They may have seen Sirius B uh, if they had really good eyesight. That's possible. Um, but it is unlikely that the the stories about the Dogon having known that it was its own star and that there was life around it and that the life came to Earth, that is probably not true. That's probably not actually their uh, original belief. Um, it seems that it's because a, a European anthropologist who wanted to study the Dogon, who had knowledge about this uh, other star around Sirius, came to the Dogon and inserted that knowledge into his interpretations of what the Dogon were telling him. Um, that's actually very common in old anthropology. And now anthropologists learn as much as possible how not to insert their own knowledge into their interpretation. Uh, that does not mean they weren't accomplished astronomers. That does not mean that they couldn't see the star, but I think that is a is an urban legend. Um, yeah. Thank you. All righty. Next up, we have Brendan again. That 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 was a, a great answer because in 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 ethnographic studies, they there's there's a saying that you can impact the answer just by asking the question, right? So, yes. So, yep. So I have an actual question. This is from uh, Anthony, right? He's the leader of our uh, our astronomy club. He actually wasn't able to uh, attend the meeting, and this would have been a real treat for him. But I'm going to be his representative. I'm going to ask the question from him. You know, he spends a lot of time around his telescopes and tinkering around outside. So his question is regarding tools and instruments. Um, so he's asking, let's see if I can share this right quick. So his question is, which instruments and data sets do you utilize most frequently for your work? And I'm presuming he's saying when you were you're doing active work as a scientist or astrophysicist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was actively doing research in grad school, I mostly used publicly available data from space-based telescopes. My research was all about the galactic habitable zone, um, which was a, a pretty new area of research relatively speaking. And the whole goal of this field is to figure out where in the galaxy the conditions for life are most likely to be found. But that's a really interdisciplinary question. Most astronomers become experts in moons or uh, one, like, or planets or, or one uh, type of star, you know? Um, to do this research, I had to know about the relationship between planets and habitability, planets and their stars, stars and their location of the galaxy. I had to know how galaxies evolve over billions of years. Um, and so the two main types of data that I needed were um, 
a database of all of the planets we had discovered and what star they orbited, and then information about how those stars move around the galaxy. So the, for the first set of information, I mostly used Kepler data. Kepler was a, a really beautiful mission that was launched in 2009 and retired in 2018, but it was responsible for finding thousands of the exoplanets that we have confirmed. Uh, it was a beautiful little transit photometry powerhouse. Uh, it found planets by looking for the shadows that they cast on their stars. Um, and it was it's my favorite mission in astronomy. So that told me where all the planets are that we've found. Uh, and then the other one was Gaia. Gaia is a gorgeous spacecraft that is giving us the most accurate and precise map of stars and their positions and motions in the Milky Way galaxy. It's giving us a map of over a billion stars in the Milky Way. Um, and it tells us where they are now. It tells us where they're moving so we can predict uh, how their orbits will change over time. Yeah, uh, so that data is all publicly available, um, which was really nice because I didn't have to apply for time on telescopes. I actually am not very good at using a telescope. Um, but these are also all like huge science grade instruments that you need to apply uh, for time on. Those are the ground-based telescopes. For ones that you could get for your backyard, I am even more useless. Um, I have, I've never uh, been, a, been like a leader for a backyard astronomy gazing type of thing, but um, you can get a, a good telescope for uh, like 50 bucks these days, which is, which is kind of nice. Oh, wow. Wow. It's interesting because you, when you talk about the data sets, right, sort of like, you know, you think about Isaac Newton and how brilliant he was, right? But he wouldn't have been able to do what he did in terms of his laws of motion without that data set that he got from the Royal Observatory. So, mm. so yeah, that is, uh, it's interesting. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And it, it is nice that a lot of publicly funded observatories these days do have to make at least part of their data, data publicly available. Um, there are cool projects that you can do to actually comb through data. If you go to zooniverse.com, Z-O-O-N-I-V-E-R-S-E, Zooniverse, um, you can get involved with, with science and use real data. Awesome. All righty, so I'm up next. My question is, someone told me, a little birdie told me that you, Moonlight, is a comedian. So oh, no. do you have a cute little Cosmo, <laughs> joke you can tell us it's not anything <laughs> i have done two two stand-up sets um <laughs> and they were not about science they were about um stuff that i feel like i shouldn't repeat in the professional no problem setting. well that's fine um for like a <laughs> like a silly let me i wish oh now i, I need to have like an on-command science joke but nothing's coming to me. You know, it was it was a shout out out of the dark. I thought maybe you would have one, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's there's the classic. There's the classic. Um, uh, you know, God looked down on on the creation of the solar system, and and one one planet stood out um, from among the rest. And how do you know which one it was? Don't know. It was it was Saturn. He liked it, so he put a ring on it. Ah, okay. See, we got it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. So up next we have Juju again. Let me get Juju up here. <laughs> yeah. So how does folklore shape and reflect the cultural identity of different societies or communities? Oof. Big question. This is like people get whole degrees in this stuff. Um, I think the the most fundamental answer I can give you is that the culture that arises from a group is kind of a direct consequence of what that group needs to do to survive and what resources they have available. So the reason you see differences in uh, cultures 
in different parts of the world is because they had different access to like different types of food, different materials to build their homes, different uh, patterns that they would see in nature and want to emulate in their fashion or something, you know, or they would have to overcome problems that were regionally specific. This is why, um, you know, you don't, there, there is something that uh, historians talk about when it comes to wheels in the desert, like why why didn't these very old societies develop wheels? Uh, and it's because they had camels and other animals that could carry things over the desert. They didn't need to have carts that transported that. Um, and in like European societies, they had roads or, or flatter, rockier paths to roll carts on. Um, and so, yeah, culture looks different in different parts of the world just because they, they're they doing the same stuff, but with, but with different stuff. Just one awesome. second. Who do we have coming up next? I think it's me next. Uh, Got Brendan again. And, and, this, yeah. and this is another uh, folklore uh, type conver conversational question here. Let's see if I can bring it up, right? So, you know, in terms of how we, we talk about, you know, cultural history being preserved, right, um, using both old tradition, and this is, this is in African and indigenous uh, population groups, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you discuss the importance of storytelling in oral tradition as it relates to folklore, right? Oh. And, and, and this is specifically as it relates to things like, you know, the transmission of cultural values, uh, the transmission of belief systems, and uh, knowledge transfer across you know, your generations in the population groups. Mm, yeah, this is a, a big topic. Um, so first I should say that these stories, the folklore function, no, actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna start even earlier than that. Writing was invented. Um, at first humans had to just talk about things. They had to remember information because they couldn't write it down and store it for later or transport it to somewhere else. We learned and we lived by word of mouth. Um, and so we had to get really good at remembering stuff and our brains are kind of hardwired to remember narrative. We are hardwired to pay attention to and remember stories. And so we encoded some of the most important information that our future generations needed to know in stories. Um, we encoded information about where the good water and where the good food sources were in myths about uh, mystical creatures. We encoded information about when big storms were coming in myths about gods that have a, a behavior cycle in the sky, you know? And, and so we needed to have folklore in order to survive or else future generations would have forgotten the lessons that their ancestors learned. So that takes us to some of the, the functions of folklore. Really, it is uh, to educate. Uh, it educates people about social norms. These are like little fairy tales, like um, the uh, Hansel and Gretel that tell you to not stray off the beaten path in the woods, um, or Little Red Riding Hood, no, don't stray from the beaten path, don't trust strangers. Uh, so they teach us social norms. They teach us really important cultural things that we need to survive, like where the food is, where, uh, when the seasonal storms are coming. And it it's fun. Um, it's entertaining. It's a way for us to pass time on a Saturday night before they had TikTok. And uh, it, it cements our identities as a community. When you interact with someone else who knows your same stories, who who is embedded in your same culture and folklore, you experience that kinship. Um, I'm sure we've we've all experienced it. Uh, if we've ever, you know, suddenly seen another another black person in a space where there aren't a lot of us, you know, we we have these cultural touchstones that we will use to communicate to each other, like, hey, we have this thing in common. Um, and especially as communities who have been oppressed, who have had their culture taken away from them, oral storytelling is a really powerful way to hold on to your uh, identity, to hold on to your, your ancestors and your past, um, because you can't write it down because people are going to find it. Um, so you have to pass it on through stories, often in coded language. 
Um, that was definitely something that that a lot of enslaved people were doing here in the U.S. for sure. Um, folklore oh. literally saves lives. Oh, I, I sort of I sort of like that. You know, folk folklore as a mechanism of for human survival, right? Mm -hmm. and, and more importantly, a mechanism for having fun, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, that was that part one right there. All right. Yeah, that was that was fine. Oh, uh, yeah, that was. Oh, uh, what was that? Was that you or me? Who was that? That was you. Was that me? <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah, that was that was smash right there, man. That was. Yeah, I like that. That was a good part one of that, man. We're going to bring the rest of that, man. I like that conversation right there. Um, Yeah. I think that was pretty good, man. I think we did our thing for the night, man. Um, I don't think we would have messed the interview up. I think that was good. Um, any commentary on that, you think? Nah. You think? I would say in terms of, I, I really appreciate the way she sort of delivers her answers. She's very concise, uh, especially, you know, with us being very time constrained and we had a ton of different topics that we wanted to discuss with, her, right? Mm -hmm. Um, this was both on the scientific side regarding astrophysics and on the folklore side. So, you know, with her being, you know, sort of an expert in both of those areas and getting through the ton of questions that we had, she did an outstanding job. Yeah, I thought she did, man. I appreciate the interview, man. The second half is even more powerful. Yeah, man, y'all can go ahead and, um, you know, rewind that download, man. Send it out to your family. And that's just part of our catalog of what we're actually doing. Um, maybe tomorrow we'll go ahead and play the, the other uh astrophysicist we had on. Go ahead and play that. We got that queued up too. And that's part of the work. That's what we're doing, man. We're gonna, you know, the out of these conversations we have, we're gonna bring experts on the conversation. So we brought the two physicists, right? And I'm gonna always ask them questions that's going down in the community about that, right? So, like when we bring an anthropologist on, we'll ask about was Charles Darwin thing outdated. Right. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll ask, we'll bring an expert in Egypt. We'll ask him, well, is this that right? That's always going to be the measure. And we're going to find out what side of history uh, people uh, fall on. Any of the ladies, uh, you, Mr. Uh, did you enjoy that interview? I thought you did a great job of, you know, controlling the controls and, and, and just moving it forward. I appreciate both of the sisters. Uh, CK, they was actually in charge of the interview. Mm -hmm. That that's why it was really high level professional. If I was in charge of it, I don't know the crowd. No, the dove out the window on him. But yeah, yeah. also appreciate yeah. Brendan. A little shaky there, right? Appreciate <laughs> Brendan. Appreciate yeah. Brendan nah, you know what I'm saying? And I appreciate Kent and all the pseudo killers. But go ahead, Miss Tiff. Uh, what do you what do you think about that? And our thing going forward. I appreciate it, you know, the way she answered the questions, very straight to the point. And she was able to give a lot of information. She chose her her words, you know, she was just an expert at it. She was an expert. Back. Mm. <laughs> Fun. And, and it was sort of in contrast to um, the interview that we did with uh, Dr. Farah from the University of Hawaii, right? Because he was really steeped in the science part of the conversation, right? So, so being able to actually have her, uh, which was more approachable for people that may not necessarily be a physics enthusiast, I think that was helpful um, yeah. with this, with, with this, and with especially with this particular um, community, right? She made it. She made it palatable. Right. Absolutely. Very approachable from that yeah. regard. But you must remember also, she is a self-proclaimed science communicator. And if we look up the definition, it is exactly that, brain, bringing forth scientific information. Um, and that, that, is her, that is her niche, is to do it in a palatable way um, for those who are not as scientifically engaged or, um, you know, or whatnot. So, and, and the fact that she was also a major in folklore, um, it helped us navigate 
our questions a little differently. And while we were doing research, well, me in particular, I'll speak for myself, doing research and looking at some of her podcasts and whatnot, and also reading her excellent work, um, um, Autobiography of Our Galaxy, The Milky Way, by that, it was a little bit more relaxing and less intimidating for me personally. Um, even with Dr. Farah, I may have been intimidated in the beginning, but once we got into that interview, he himself, I mean, the weight of the information is is astronomical, but he made it approachable for me and very engaging still. He was just very... Um, very specific. And with that specificity, it came a little bit longer in his answers, you know, but she's a pro at it. So I think that was the fundamental difference. Yeah. Great communicator, right? <laughs> exactly. An excellent science communicator. So and I yeah. think it kind of speaks to what I talked about earlier and wondering why people think from from their seat on YouTube and TikTok, that they can overthrow an expert, a professional person that gets paid to do it, to study, to understand the nuances um, in said field, to understand the field, to understand, you know, the, you know, science guides us, right, on earth through situations that uh, a lot of times, 350,000 years ago, we, we just had not built up a big enough catalog to really, you know, understand a lot of the things. Like, like we said, there's no missing steps in nature. You can't just jump to the answer. And that's why I love science. It, it forces you to build a foundation. So if you just think you're going to understand how human beings came to be and why it's in Africa and not other places as of 2000 and 2023, you're just not going to jump into it. It doesn't, it doesn't seem right. Right. No, no one wants to think they're animal. Right. But we're used to saying that we're mammals. Right. But elephants are mammals, too. But that doesn't make you an elephant. You mm -hmm. know, so no one wants to actually, you know, uh, uh, feel that way because because we're human centric and we feel like we are the best. And for years, hundreds of years, thousands of years, they couldn't. They thought that the sun actually revolved around Earth. Because we're earth centric, you know, we got the only spot in the cosmos. You, you look at our religion, our religion is based on earth, right? And 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 we always feel like we're the most important. But thank goodness, uh, for people like Dr. Moya, okay, that mm -hmm. that, that that like she said, uh, we look to the cosmos, right, to get knowledge about the cosmos, and, and it's an important, it's an important step. Uh, our taxpayer money. Uh, goes to a lot of those things and it's about time that our community start to actually invest in that so so find a program find some science communicators man hopefully it's us man you know donate we're building a tight tight organization around here man and we're going to be around for a long time it's all in the name of pseudo killers man and you know i appreciate teamwork Right. I, I just appreciate all the work that everybody putting in. I also appreciate the level of professionalism. I, I personally just think I'm ready for the stage. I wouldn't have been ready a couple of years ago. Right. For the for the direction we're going in, because I just felt like people should just get cussed out. Let me stop that. Anyway, <laughs> and, well, and they still do now. Yeah, they deserve it. Not but, that they don't deserve it. Right? <laughs> but it like this, though. You know you you know you slick with it, right? When you can talk to the experts and yeah. the people that you've been debating, I can't help but mention this, right? Because the chat brought it up. When you mm. talk to the experts and they they say, "Yo, that Dogon debate is mm -hmm. over." <laughs> I just wanted to say that, but go ahead. I missed that. My son dove in my ear. Kent, Kent was trying to put a feather in his hat or something, right? Now. I don't I don't know. He's patting himself on the oh, back or something. I don't know. <laughs> That's what he's doing. Hello, yeah. Okay. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I but, don't you know. I don't respect, know. I respect to the brothers. You know what I'm saying? But hey, when the experts say it, bro, hey, you know we ain't we don't play around when it comes to this science. Got that validation. Right. There you go. Man. Right. 
And we read the works. It's undefeated, man. Come on. <laughs> the death. Of, 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 of course, of course, we have to use these engagements to settle a few scores, right? So oh, yeah, put, some all point, day. put some points yeah. on the board. Like, I, can't the the scores. I can't imagine what scores you have yet to settle. <laughs> oh, we're gonna get them and ain't over with. We oh, it's quite a few. It's quite a few. <laughs> Matter of fact, I heard Cedric is over there beating the brakes off of Lex right now. Of course, he's gonna beat the brakes off him. Did y'all think it was gonna be anything? Oh man. I heard a claim today. How how could nucleosynthesis be possible? How 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 could all of the the hydrogen in the universe form in the first five minutes after the formation after the Big Bang? How that doesn't make sense to me. Right? I got the clip too, but I don't so know we'll about see. the in this moment. I got the nah. clip. Maybe we'll say that for Monday. Maybe. Say or or know. say that I don't know for the debate. I don't know. But again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll save that. We, we've done no, we've no. done clinics on these conversations. Mm. Clinics. So yeah. yeah, we uh uh you know for me being able to converse. See, we had we will have a meeting with the expert, actually converse with them, and, and and for me being able to transmit the ideas that I'm talking about and understand uh, some of the things that they're saying, I think that's proof positive to the work that everybody's dedicated. And learning around here, I think it. Is, I think that's important to be able to understand what she's saying uh, at a level where we can bring it back to the community, and that's basically what we're doing here. And yeah, we're not going nowhere no time soon. So yeah, so death to the pseudos, y'all know what it is, man. So yeah, man, a lot of people came in the building today, man. Um, we don't want this to be too long. We want to be able to, you know, we want y'all to go back. Send this out to your family. Say, yeah, check this out. This is what an astrophysicist does, right? Uh, le learn about the world you live in. Mm -hmm. Know know where your place is in the cosmos. And uh, be honest with you, Kent. I thought you actually asked the best question because well, I never yeah. thought about it. Yeah, that was good, and it was funny when you asked it in the meeting. Mm -hmm. You was like, you said you, you, you your people's got you with it. <laughs> Yeah, that was yeah, that was a yeah, that was a heavy style. Like, yeah, okay, I'm yeah, fine out though. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. So yeah, yeah. and we appreciate all the support, man. Y'all know what it is, man. Hit the cash app, hit the likes, man. Subscribe to the community skeptics, subscribe to the pseudo killers. Y'all know y'all can catch me over there at Black News 102, man. Um, I think I'm gonna dive on there for a minute, man. We got anything to add to this, man. I think we keep it short and sweet, man, so they can go back. And uh, check out the star of the show because Dr. Moya was definitely the star of the show. Y'all want to add anything, man, for we tap out of what? What's good? It was great. It was a great was show. A great interview. Yeah. Right, great show. Yeah, yeah figure out when we want to figure, figure out when we want to do the part two, give it a couple more weeks, throw that part two in there for the family. Yep. And also, we'll slide some of the uh, the content from the interview with Dr. Farah as well. Uh, yeah, should we be still some. Got should be some interesting scientific conversations that comes out of that. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, so look, man, I appreciate everybody uh, that tapped in tonight, man. Hey. Hey, Human 2.0, I see you. All right, Joe Armstrong, I see you. Regular Joe, what's good with you? Zoo 221. I see you, Professor X in the building. Y'all know what it is. Gideon Block, man, I appreciate you, bro. Y'all already know what it is, man. Appreciate all the pseudo killers, man. I appreciate the whole thing. Gina A, Ren TV. I see you. All right. So that's what it was, man. We put that thing down. And y'all already know how it is. Yo, we doing it strong, man. And you know what, man? At the end of the day, how they say it, don't hate us. Hate the game. The game made us, yo. And all heroes, all heroes <laughs> need a theme song. To all the heroes to transmit science, man. Man, we doing it for the betterment of our community. You know, moving us forward, man. Hey, yo, ain't nothing but love around here, man. We doing it because we appreciate everything that's going on in the community, man. We might be battling with the pseudos, but at the end of the day, we got a soft spot for you. But we got to make sure the information is right and exact, man. Y'all know what it is. Shout out to DQ, man, for putting that together, man. You know we got our thing song. Don't hate us, man. Hate the game. The game made us. 
Y'all know what like it is, man. So what's up and show me, homie, you shut up and mute up a moment. The mad scientist, I'm knowing all the components. We own it, and we gon' off it if it's pseudo. You do know we don't entertain, they keep what you know. That big Bobby banger out of Baltimore. Done it all, shop before, sold a little something, but I taught you more. Then your average teacher, I had to reach it at your level to bring you up. No devil can never beat you with precision of a magi. The information supplied by some guys get debunked. On live, CK and Juju, I chill in the cut. But if your boys wanna fade, then I'm chefing you up. I organize live, the beats are disorganized. Truth every time. Kudos, kudos, niggas. Decorated pseudo killers. Space age that begins, back again. An organized live, the beats are disorganized. Truth every time. Kudos, kudos, niggas. Decorated pseudo killers. Space age that begins, tapping in. I always been fly, that's an actual omen You can catch me in the sky, ask Anthony Bowman He see me with his telescope, I was actually floating Off some good cushion, the Savio is actually growing See Gulla Gulla and Kent, is where the money gets spent Them boys got some books that cost as much as you rent The second verse should be smash rock well, but I rock well Underground like Samaria and rock well In the ring like I'm the rock well, hell Create a different wave that can rock wells. Hell, shit swell like lunatides My entendres, off gondra to who describe Euthanized foolish guys Scholastically, haphazardly Turn your camera on and look me in my eyes And please do subscribe Ain't the 80 blind cripple or crazy You in for a new surprise It's DQ A organized lie The beats are disorganized Truth every time Kudos, kudos, niggas Ooh. Decorated pseudo killers yeah, yeah. Space age that begins Back again An organized lie Fly. The beats are disorganized Truth every time Kudos, kudos, niggas Ooh. Decorated pseudo killers yeah, yeah. Space age that begins Tapping in